we will have uh, entrepreneurs uh, taking three minutes each to tell their story. And um, you'll be hearing from eight terrific, diverse companies, different businesses, different fields of endeavor, um, basically about their experiences doing business here in Silicon Valley. So this is uh, for the speakers. Um, you uh, will have three minutes each. Give you a little bit of latitude, but if you, as you wrap up, if you see me give the thumbs up sign, uh, that means your time is up. And in fairness to the other speakers, please wrap up quickly so that we can work everybody in. Fair enough? So first, we um, have Julia Hu, who's the CEO and co-founder of Lark. Julia, please uh, get us started. When I was a little girl, um, I would wake up with horrible, horrible stomach attacks. And it really felt like my stomach was eating itself. And every few weeks, it would happen for hours and hours. Um, and so I, I grew up uh, for 20-something years with an undiagnosed chronic disease. And I really don't know what I would have done if I didn't have my tag team, my dad and my lovely pediatrician. They were helping me emotionally, basically change my entire life. Um, and through about 10 years of experimentation, I was able to you know, get rid of 90% of all of my attacks um, through eating healthier, um, stressing less, and exercising more. Um, and so that's really who Lark uh, and the Lark Coach is inspired by, uh, a 24-hour personal health team. So this is Lark. Can we play this uh, audio? Eggs, Eggs bacon, bacon, and a side, and a of, side toast of toast and coffee. And coffee. is your 24-7 personal health team. It's, it's really the top experts in the world, um, but speaking to you personally. And we do that by using artificial intelligence. So uh, over the last few years, we've been, we've been working on this AI for a long time, cloning these amazing doctors. And uh, luckily, you know, I think it's getting somewhere. People are really treating Lark, your Lark coach, as a friend. So um, we were recently named top 10 apps of 2015 by Apple. Um, so I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, Samsung pre-installed us uh, in all of their new phones. Um, and uh, Lark, Uber, Airbnb, and WeChat were named the top 10 most innovative companies in the world. Um, and uh, Wall Street Analyst named us the top most innovative digital health product of the year. And we really think it's because artificial intelligence is not just helping you understand data, but really helping you with emotional needs. Because people like me, people with chronic diseases, are all amongst us. In the US, we spend $1 trillion a year on chronic diseases, like diabetes, like obesity-related diseases, hypertension, heart disease. And awesome. Awesome. And, um, and so we have cloned some of the world's best experts from Harvard and Stanford. And uh, my email is Julia, who? Julia at lark.com. And I hope uh, healthcare innovators can work with us. Thanks, Julia. Next up, we have Swati Chaturvedi, uh, who's going to talk about why we need an online investment platform for deep tech. She's the CEO and co-founder of Propelex. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a delight to be here talking to this audience that believes in the power of science and technology to change the world. Perhaps like some of you here, I have dreamt of being the next Elon Musk. Now, while chances are slim of getting there, I am not losing all hope, and neither should you. There are many people out there, like you and me, who believe in science, 
who understand that investing in startups that could be the next Tesla or SpaceX is not just good for humanity, it's also great business sense. Now, what if I were to tell you that all of us can be the next Elon Musk? What if, by investing in science-based companies, we could unleash huge innovations, grow great businesses, and change the world we live in? Startups can move much faster than big businesses and have greater impact. Yet, when it comes to investing, less than 0.1% of the $58 trillion under management in the US goes into early stage science and technology investing. Why is this? It's because these startups are hard to discover and they're hard to understand. And that is why many investors struggle to participate in these companies. This is what inspired me and my co-founder to start the MIT Angels Group in 2013, which is now ably managed by Ronjon, while we focus on PropelX, which is an online investment platform. So PropelX is the place where investors looking for the next Tesla or Celera or Genentech or Google can discover, access, and participate in science and technology startups. So let me give you uh, three quick examples of how some of these innovative startups have worked with us to reach investors like you. I'm going to race through these. Uh, so Aromics, digitizing the sense of smell and taste out of Stanford StartX Accelerator, raised 475K on PropelX. Positron Dynamics, it is rocket science. And our experts, including rocket scientists, former NASA scientists, physicists, responded to specific investor questions to help them understand and make an informed investment decision. Positron Dynamics raised $38,000 via a PropelX LLC, where we enabled investors to put in as little as $3,000. Sensolin, we helped them raise over a million dollars. They're developing a glucose-responsive insulin. The important thing is our global platform allowed international investors to participate, which they could never have done without PropelX. So, I start out by talking about Elon Musk, and as I close, I want to bring us back to this icon of science and technology. We may not be able to achieve everything that he has done in his lifetime, but we can get close. You can still follow your passion for science and technology, expand and diversify your portfolio, and make this world a better place by joining us at PropelX as we bring groundbreaking technologies to market faster. So please, get your phones out now and join us at propelx.com. Thank you. Our next speaker is, Brian, is Ryan Borker, CEO of Shortlist, who will talk about disrupting headhunting, bringing human peer judgment back to recruiting. Ryan, please. So we all know great businesses are made of technology. Great businesses are also made of people. And that's what we're doing here at Shortlist, is bringing great people to companies. In fact, replacing one of the most hated parts of the hiring process, hiring a headhunter. Um, many of you guys are very senior. You've probably dealt with them before. They're really expensive. They're really painful. And we've already placed some of the most senior people in asset management, including one of the top 10 people who moved last year. I'm going to try and talk about Shortlist as well as mis machine intelligence in three minutes. So I've got quite a bit to go through. Um, a little bit about Shortlist, I just told you, we are replacing headhunters with a curated network of senior professionals. We're going to do this across all industries, but we're starting in investment management. You can read about us in Funfire. We were featured this morning. We've also been featured in the past, which is the Financial Times of Asset Management. But let's talk a little bit about machine intelligence, which is all the rage here in Silicon Valley. Um, there are some problems, like Lark, which it's really good for. There are others that it's not so good for. Now, you can take a machine model, and you can start, and you'll see a lot of encouraging progress when you try and solve a problem. You extrapolate that, and you see that on this model, which comes from Crowdflower, uh, a competition that they did for Kaggle, that they were going to get to 100%, weren't they? The issue is, very quickly over time, models reach their limits. Now, why is this a problem? Now, if you are dating, you don't want an 80% fit. This is the reason that we can't open up our phones and Tinder and eHarmony and get our 10 matches. This is the same thing for hiring. 
the guy at LinkedIn who created Bright, which is a data intelligence machine learning startup for hiring, found this out, got acquired for $80 million, and just last fall, on the stage of LinkedIn Talent Connect, realized that we can't solve the hiring problem with machine intelligence. So we have now this $12 billion industry that is not solvable by machine intelligence, but the status quo of executive headhunting is no good either. So what are we doing at Shortlist? We're blending human judgment and technology. We're using machine intelligence where we can to route the roles to the right people to make sure that we understand who makes good recommendations and using humans to make recommendations who understand all of the subtle, subtle things that machines can never understand about what it takes to hire someone great for your organization. We're very interested in talking to anyone in financial services or investment management or anybody who's interested in the intersection of human judgment and technology. My name is Ryan Borker. I'm the co-founder and head of product here and we'll be around afterwards. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Ryan. Next, we'll hear from Connor Madigan, the president and co-founder of Kativa, who will talk about what will happen when we put display technology on everything curvable, bendable, and rollable displays. Connor? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about Kativa. It's a company I co-founded in uh, 2008. And uh, what we work on is how to build uh, the machinery that's used to make a new generation of flat panel displays. Uh, and just as a preview before I go into the slides, the technology we work on is called OLED. It's a replacement for LCD, and uh, it's already being implemented uh, in a lot of Samsung products, and actually it's appropriate that I'm here as Samsung was one of our very first partners. So uh, basically, uh, one of the, the things that we've been thinking a lot about now is what happens when we can get away from having to have a flat, rigid uh, display. Uh, this is an example of uh, what that might be like uh, with the audio. Specifically, what we do is we use inkjet printing, like the printing you would use for your home photo printer, except much bigger and much more precise to put down pattern coatings. And uh, what made us unique is that we were the first company to apply this technology from the ground up to solving the manufacturing problems in OLED. And uh, it's actually something I started to work on in 1998, and then worked on at MIT, and then spun out the company in 2008. Um, so we introduced these products in 2013. Uh, Samsung was our very first customer, uh, and they are now uh, entrenched in essentially all of the OLED mass production lines that make flexible uh, displays. Um, so this was incubated first at MIT. Uh, we sell giant machinery, which is a fairly unusual thing for a startup to do. Um, our first, when, when our first investors uh, asked us about uh, what this would take, we told them $100 million in seven years. Um, and fortunately, they, they stuck with us through that. Um, what we can say is that without our machines, flexible displays like you're seeing now would not have moved into mass production. Um, and uh, we've had good success working with strategic investors. So if anybody has questions about that, you can ask me about that. I have lots to say. But, uh, and we're about 150 staff worldwide now uh, and projected within five years now that we've sort of crossed the threshold to mass production to get to around a, a billion dollars in annual revenues within five years. So next up is Todd Mostak, who's uh, CEO and co-founder of MapD, talking about lightning fast big data analytics. I'm Todd Mostak, CEO and founder of MapD, uh, former researcher in the MIT database group. Uh, MapD is, uh, we have a lot of great corporate sponsors, early investors in Google, Google Ventures and NVIDIA. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about our technology. Um, great. So you know, MapD uh, is a lightning fast big data analytics and visualization platform that leverages the power and parallelism of commodity graphics cards, of GPUs, to literally allow analysts to visually explore multi-billion row data sets with latencies measured in milliseconds. 
It was built to address the following problem. Organizations are awash in all this data that they need to interactively explore to extract real-time insights from. Uh, but unfortunately, with today's CPU and memory databases and analytics platforms, they're just not fast enough to achieve that. And why is that? Um, it's because we use GPUs effectively. Um, so your common garden variety in-memory database, CPU in-memory database, will have 10, 20, maybe 30 cores per server. Compare that to MapD, we'll be running across eight GPUs uh, using up to 40,000 GPU cores. And that literally means uh, orders of magnitude speedups. Uh, we commonly see 100 plus X speedups on common SQL queries. And uh, not only that, but we can actually take the results and visualize them with the graphics cards themselves. So in a nutshell, what MapD is, is it's a software platform, runs on uh, commodity GPUs, up to 16 per server. Uh, it's a column store database plus this, uh, this next gen rendering engine. And it basically gives you these 100 plus X speed ups on queries. It can visualize the results of those queries by keeping the data right on the GPU and rendering it without copying the data to the client. And finally, there's a great TCO component in the sense that um, one of our customers benched us against Impala and what took 20 Impala servers 20 seconds, we did on one server, one 4U server in 160 milliseconds. Um, so it's pretty game changing, we think. Um, can you cut to the video? So I thought I'd be able to give a live demo, but evidently not. So there's a quick video of, um, this is actually a very small data set for us. This is 60 million rows, just running on one GPU. Um, if I had a live demo, I, we could do more, but you'll get the, um, you get the idea. This is 60 million tweets. Um, basically, you can see the visualization here. We're actually rendering this on the GPU as a result of a SQL query. We're showing the top hashtags. I can filter by language. All of this is in real time. So nothing is pre-can, pre-query, pre-aggregated. It's all operating at the grain level data, which conventional BI systems just simply cannot do. Um, so you get this idea. We're not just tweets. This is just a demo. Um, we work with leading telecoms. Uh, leading retailers, uh, social media giants, um, all of these are early customers and are finding um, that the great speed ups that MapD offers um, are game changing. So if you want to check us out, go to our website, check out our demo. Thank you very much. Next we'll hear from Kevin Liu, who is CEO of Hakuna, talking about transforming senior care with technology. Um, so I want to tell you about my grandma. I love my grandma. She used to live on the other side of the bay. Um, and I spent many summers with her uh, when I was a kid. Um, and a few years ago when she became ill, uh, we needed to find someone to care for her um, at home. And uh, some of them will work out for a few weeks and then they'll stop coming on time. They'll leave early, they'll come late, and then at the end, um, they just don't show up. So in the end, we have to move her um, back to Taiwan and hire a person to take care of her full time. And this experience got me thinking, like, why is the industry so broken? And then the more I look into it, I realize that my, my experience was not uncommon. And this industry has been operating the same way for the last 20 years. Um, they don't have in, in technology infrastructure. Uh, what little data that they have is incoherent at best because um, they do not really rely on technology to help uh, make their operations better. Um, so we got a license to operate um, a home care company and we have interviewed over 3,000 caregivers to date. Um, we have hired over um, a little bit over 200 of them um, as our W2 employees. And throughout this process, we learn as much as we can about them, like who, take his, who takes care of your kids when you're not home, and what makes you want to become a caregiver. Like All these questions help us understand who they are, because people seem to forget that good home care is about good caregivers. And um, because we're able to learn more about them, we can actually make better matches. Um, so if we can play the video. Um, for every client that we have, um, we have something called the care profile. Um, the care profile um, hosts um, all, all the data that we have um, on the client, like what do they like to eat, what kind of music do they like, um, what the, what's the name of their uh, pets. Like The more we know about them, the better a match our system can recommend. And in addition to that, we give every client a plan of care. So this is something that's designed to keep our clients active and independent, and this is designed by our nurses at the initial client assessment. So this, what you see here, will be pushed down from the server to the mobile app that we have. We give every um, caregiver an iPhone if they don't have one. So this structures how they spend time with our clients at home, and they also 
they pretty good notes, um, and the families love this because we bring them into the cares if they're there, and we push that out um, every after each care session, and this is also saved on the server. So what we have here is a upgrade from the pen and paper on the kitchen counter uh, where people will come in and write and then scribble what they did for the day. Uh, we have a lot more Okay, uh, we have a lot more information to go on if we can get that back. Um, uh, sure, so we know what's going on and we want to uh, work with folks um, who are building this Internet of Things because in the future more and more healthcare will be delivered at home and we're building the fabric for the ecosystem. So we are Hakuna and we're bringing better home care to someone near you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Eduardo Torres Jara, who's president of Robot Rebuilt talking about revolutionizing industrial robotics through tactile perception. So, I was saying, um, across the industry, it's necessary to automate uh, all the manual tasks, or at least there's interest in doing most of the automation of the manual tasks. Turns out that with the current technology, only 80% of those, uh, those uh, only 20% of those tasks are possible to automate. 80% we can't because the technology does not allow us. And it is, uh, uh, understanding ar across the industry that that innovation is going to come mainly in the hands, in the hands of the robots. Why is it difficult? It's very difficult because current technology is only based on uh, getting the robot to a position, which is, we can do it very precisely, but it's very dangerous because it's very stiff and if you get on the way or if the robot is no in the right place to, ma to handle the object, it actually will destroy the object. We are very different. Uh, we humans are very soft and very sensitive. So the solution that we came out with is very biologically inspired, and we analyze a lot of manipulation of human and animals and see what happens. Turns out that we understand very well how, what happens at the moment of contact, so we use our tactile feedback, or in general, our tactile perception to do that. Now, doing this in robots is very difficult. Uh, turns out that the details that you have to go through, um, there are many. And so we had to start to rebuild the robot from the fingertip all the way to the head as opposed to how it's usually do, done right now. And uh, here are some examples of how it works. Do you mind playing the video on the top and the left? Your left. So this is one robot that you'll see is uh, doing all the operation based in tactile feedback. You, know, you can think of the same way that um, when you wake up at night looking for your remote control, you touch it and then you use the information on the uh, on the remote control, you, you use the, all, all the, um, the changes uh, in, in the fingers and the information, and you can get that to, you can use that to actually grab the object. So the robot is doing that exactly, palpating it around, finding the information about the object, grabbing it, lifting it. When it's lifting, it's actually understanding that the robot is not sleep, uh, the object is not sleeping away, and when it brings it back, actually understand and make contact with the table, and then it's safe to release it. Uh, we do even more complicated. Did you play the one on the right? more complicated task with the fingertips. Uh, the fingertips are way more difficult to operate with regular robots because uh, they need more precision and so we can do it uh, very well. Sorry, I'm running behind. Um, so what we have done is we have this prototype, it's called Tactical and basically it's a robot completely covered by tactile feedback which allows you to do all this task. Um, just to put in context where we are, uh, there's industrial robots on the right, there's some interactive robots that are soft in the middle, and we are the next generation. And here are all the people who are behind us, and we are very thankful for the sponsorship and you know, the partnership that we have from, with MIT. And thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. And our last speaker is Martin Aboites. Hope I pronounced that correctly or close to it. Um, CEO and founder of HealthJump, talking about the value of health data interoperability. So three minutes. The value of health data interoperability. Uh, we all know that uh, health data today doesn't really move. It's sitting in silos in our, in our various providers. So sometimes the silos are very big and it might, be, it might look like our data is interoperable, but it's not. It's sitting in a silo and it's not really moving. And um, so if we want to realize the big data objectives of being able to uh, make data actionable in health, uh, we need to solve the problem of uh, interoperability. So that's what uh, HealthJump is addressing. Now, why this problem has not been solved when, when it has been solved in many other industries is, uh, is really the, uh, the crux of my, uh, of my uh, presentation, three minutes, is that health data 
did not need to move in the past because there was not that much value to the data itself. This is changing. The good news is that uh, we are changing from uh, fee-for-service to uh, pay-for-performance in, in, uh, in healthcare. In fee-for-service, if you go to a doctor, you see the doctor twice, the doctor bills the, uh, the insurance twice, and that's, that's the end of the story. Um, in uh, pay-for-performance, it's actually quite different. The doctor gets paid for the outcome of your, uh, of your visit, and if he can uh, deal with you in one visit instead of two, then that's actually uh, a benefit to the doctor. And if he's effective, he, gets, um, he does better yet. So there's now a business driver to, uh, and to, uh, to use uh, uh, big data, to, use, to, uh, to work on data on, on, in this scheme. We, we, need to, um, we need to start, we start with the population. We, uh, we, look, at, uh, we look at what are the gaps, uh, let's say, uh, smoking. Uh, we, we want to identify who are the population of smokers are. And, uh, and then we need to uh, address, we need to contact those, uh, those smokers. Uh, we need to offer them smoke and cessation plans. We need to evaluate um, for the whole population, well, which, which, plan, which uh, smoke and cessation work, what is the effectiveness, and we're going, we're going around this circle. And for that, we need, you know, it's a simple example, but there are you know, plenty of examples in, in, in how data can be used. In, um, and for that, we need aggregated data and uh, we need aggregated data that's accessible to... Um, so that's what, what HealthJump does. Uh, HealthJump works on the integration of data, how data flows across the system from all the, play, all the providers and also the devices that, in the, the devices that an individual might use and how that data from those devices goes into the medical record. Then we help on how that data is aggregated, how, it's, uh, how it can be analyzed and then on the communication, how data, get, how um, communication is established between uh, patient and doctor and between doctors uh, leveraged on the data. So um, that's what we do. We make the record available to all members of the care continuum. We are, um, we are in, out of uh, the Northeast. We, we deal with uh, 1.5 million uh, patients right now. And uh, we'd love your help in, in uh, taking this uh, in nationally. Thank you. Mark. And let's hear it for all of our entrepreneurs. Well done. My name is Lisa Somerville. I'm the engagement officer with Startup Exchange. And we decided that we want to get everyone a little bit more engaged and have some fun today. So when you came in, you were all given a pen. I know it was confusing. Why do you need this pen? So you all have a pen and you all have your name tag. If you flip over your name tag, we're going to play a game that's similar maybe to bingo. And what you're going to do is when we say go, you're going to uh, walk around, run, whatever works for you. And you're going to meet as many people as you can and ask them the questions on the back. So for example, if I was going to be walking up to you, I might ask you if you've lived in Europe. You may say yes, you're welcome to tell me, oh, I lived in Germany, I might tell you I lived in France. And then you will initial that square on my card with this pen and I will initial it on your card. And the first three people, this is going to go on through after lunch because we know we have a break right now and we want to give you time to, to uh, take that break as well. So you're going to start now and the first three people who bring me their card and have it mostly filled out, you're going to win one of these beautiful presents that have traveled across the country from MIT. So at th on that note, we'll let you go on your break, start networking and have some fun and be playful. Thank you very much.